let's get to the reason we're all here tonight. Um, Martina Lauchenko, I'm super excited to host her. She is a partner at Silicon Valley Product Group. You know, we've had Marty on here six times before. He's a big fan, uh, a big friend of our group and a personal friend of mine. So I'm really excited um, that there's another book from SVPG that's out there, love. So I've been kind of getting the secret inside scoop from Marty. I'm like, when is your other partner going to have a book? So I'm really excited. Um, it just came out recently. She's also a partner at Costa Nova Ventures. Um, and before that, she worked at LoudCloud, Netscape, and Microsoft. And I'm really excited to um, learn what she's got to tell us about um, product marketing today and what product marketing really is and how to do it better. All right, Martina, take it away. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Uh, well, thank you, Dan, for inviting me. If I was actually on a book tour, this would have been my first stop because the book just released a week ago. So this is very exciting for me to be talking about product marketing to a group of people that know it very well and probably are very interested in learning, well, gosh, how do we actually do this better? So I actually started my career off at Microsoft as a product manager for Microsoft Word. And Microsoft was just the best place in the world for me to start my career in technology because it was kind of like going to the university of software. You got to see so many different styles of products and so many different markets and how they evolved and how Microsoft acted relative to the competition and vice versa. So incredible learning environment for me. And one year we actually had Universal Edit come out to all of the product groups saying, thou shalt produce your next version. So it sims ships with the next version of Windows. And at the time that meant that our development time was gonna be cut in half, which meant we were gonna have half the number of features that we normally would have in a release. And this was in an era where we had release cycles every 18 months to two years. And the value of a version was very much how many features are in it. We would literally slap, stick, slap stickers on the front of a box of software. And yes, software was sold in a box that would say over oh, 200 features inside. And we had just, the release prior was the most featureful version we had ever released. And now we were gonna have less than half the number of features. And we had to, pull our heads together and say, how are we going to position this next version of Word as being better than the last when the primary thing people associate with value is the number of features? So the product management team, the product marketing team got together. And one of the product marketers actually pulled out this study that had been done that captured every keystroke of users of Word. So we had a month long, 200 users, all their keystrokes captured and analyzed. And when we actually looked at the data, we realized that 75% of every action inside of Word actually came into four very simple categories, formatting, file management, printing. So the real basic stuff, still using Word more like a typewriter. And we realized when we looked at the feature enhancements that the vast majority of them actually fell into those core four areas. And it was this lightning moment where we realized this is how we can position this version of Word so that what we're doing has value. We will talk about how the enhancements that we're putting in this version focused on how people actually use Word processors and what was going to help the most users of Word as they actually use Word. And we, of course, told that story to the primary influencers of the day, which was press and analysts, and it worked and it became the best reviewed and most successful commercially version of Word up to that point in time. And I like to tell that story because it, a lot of people have different versions of what product marketing means, largely shaped by their own examples that they've seen in products uh, in companies where they've worked. And I like to, the, the whole reason I wrote the book was to really take people back and elevate the true purpose of product marketing and remind people what that actually is. It is about driving product adoption by shaping market perception through strategic marketing activities that meet business goals. So some of the strategic marketing activities would be did there, of course, meeting with the analysts, having a really tight positioning and messaging, making sure the sales team was armed with things that would help them sell this as part of a larger story, part of Microsoft Office. Here's why these features are actually the most impactful ones. The little red squiggly line that is now so commonplace in Grammarly and everything else, that was an example of a lot of this auto format as you type, that was all in this version. And of course, the primary business goal there being, 
they had to sim ship with the next version of Windows because Windows wanted to make sure that they had a wealth of really great applications available on the day that it shipped. And the one thing they could control was all of Microsoft's releases. So that's an example of how all of that activity really was all in service of what the business needed from it. And that our job was to perceive was to shape the perception so that the product would be adopted. And if this version of product marketing isn't quite what you're used to, um, we only have ourselves to blame. And by ourselves, I mean the industry writ large. I have here two, it doesn't matter if you can't really read these. The point is one of them, which is a pragmatic marketing, for example, they have seven different areas. There are 37 boxes in here. And so this literally happened to me once where I was at a company and we were trying to talk about what is the role of product marketing at this company and how should we be doing it? And somebody opened up their drawer and pulled out this piece of paper with all 37 boxes and said, this is the job of product marketing. We just do all these things. And similarly, you have the product marketing alliance. Again, all really well intentioned. There are five rings, discovery, strategy, positioning, tactics, and all these concentric circles of activity that happen and the job has become around checking 37 boxes and doing everything in the ring. And the tasks have gotten conflated with the role and the job of product marketing. And product marketing really is a discipline. That's not just a role. And that's why you'll hear me say product marketing a lot and not necessarily just product marketer, because I want all of you to come away from this thinking that we all contribute to product marketing. It's not just the product marketer who will quarterback a lot of this but really for it to be successful, product marketing and for the product marketer to be successful, it's a group and team effort. And in case you're wondering, this is where Sochi, this is where it's relevant to you. In case you're wondering, well, does product marketing really matter in the current era? Yes, it does. You might think this is a world map, but is actually a market, a Mark, MarTech technology landscape slide where they tried to put every player in every space in MarTech in one sheet. And what you're seeing here is over 8,000 companies. And five years prior, there were only 2,000 companies. So between 2015 and 2020, that explosion of growth, this is one category. This is almost as many cities as there are on the planet Earth. And if you think about that scale and what a customer is trying to make a decision about and understand what's available, what should I be doing? They're like, oh, okay, the stuff in the yellow area seems very similar to stuff in the red area. And the stuff in the blue area seems to be overlapping. And people are saying the same things. And it's really, really difficult for any customer to make sense of landscapes that are this massive and this complicated. And it's also no longer possible to say something that's totally unique. In the era I started my career, you could say something that no one else was saying. These days, you can't. There are too many products doing very similar things, claiming the same benefits. So it requires us to rethink what we're doing and, and thinking about as the role of product marketing and what the product marketer is actually driving to. And so really my book was about trying to reduce the thinking around product marketing to its most essential elements and take away all those 37 boxes and all those tasks and say, it's really about four fundamentals and yes, there are a lot of activities in service of those fundamentals, but people were losing sight of what those most important things were. So that's what I'm going to be spending most of the rest of this talk talking about. So fundamental one is being an ambassador. And by that, I mean connecting market and customer insights. That's to and from the product team to and from the go to market engine. And it's really facilitating that awareness on both sides. This is a story of a company called Web Filings, or sorry, they were called Burkiva, and they had a product called Web Filings, which is for SEC filers. So these are people that work in finance, and they have to file with the SEC every quarter. Very, very important. You get fined if you do, don't do this the proper way. And they're collecting information from across the entire organization. So naturally, if you're in finance, having multiple screens up is how you get your job done and stay productive. So these SEC filers were telling their customer success managers, you know, it'd be really nice is multiple screen support. And so they took that back to the product team and said, hey, product team, you know what? The number one request that we're getting is multi-screen support. And the product team said, yeah, that's a nice to have. 
but there are all these other must-haves, these data integrations that we have to have, these things that are fundamentally broken that we need to fix. But the customer success team just bird dog the heck out of the product team saying, you guys have to do this. This is the, I mean, this is all that people are asking us for. They're not asking us for any of that other stuff. And so the product team finally relented and they it wasn't a hard thing to do. They just needed to prioritize it. They added it to the next major release. And lo and behold, the number one talked about feature in that new release was multi-screen support. Every customer is saying like, oh my God, I'm so happy that you finally have multi-screen support. This is great. And part of what was missing in that, pro that process was that the market and the customer vantage point was solely represented by customer success. And it was easy for the product team to say like, yeah, that's just people that are talking to their customer success reps. If a product marketer had been a part, or product marketing, the discipline had been part of that conversation, they would have stopped and said, well, how will we take this to market? And does this change the perception of us? Or does this really move the needle for our customers by making, by adding this feature? So it's having a customer and market mindset that's very much oriented around what's the market implications of this feature. And that's what you want to drive with your product marketer, really connecting the dots between the customer and market insights and making sure they traffic in both ways. And so that's what the ambassadorship aspect of product marketing is. And the do for all of you that are trying to put this into practice is make sure whether you have a product marketer or not that you use market thinking in your product processes. The best way to do this, of course, is to embed a really great product marketer in your product teams. They should represent that point of view. They should facilitate those conversations. Hey, I know you guys are thinking this would be a great feature to release now, but if we do it in May, we can actually make it a part of this conference where we have these other things planned and we have a lot more wind at our back. That's what a market-based conversation sounds like in a product conversation. And that's ideally what your product marketer is doing to help bring shape to how product teams are making decisions. You also want to make sure that you're trying to think about customers' perceived value. Not all features are equal. And surprisingly, sometimes it's the simplest ones that have disproportionate value. An example there is a company that um, does data enterprise data catalogs. They had all this major heavy lifting stuff, and they had this throwaway feature that to the product team was throwaway. Right? Like, oh, yeah, we highlight um, hierarchies. Tiny little thing was the number one talked about feature in that, in that release. So you really want to try and lean into making sure that perceived value, not just what you think it's going to be, is part of that conversation. And then last but certainly not least is to encourage discussion. So it's very easy for product teams to get in their silo and to have their backlog that they're managing and really believe that they are seeing all the paths and knowing and understanding what's, more impo what's most important. But that's actually why you want those other people with a seat at the, that table. And you're listening to, again, the market and customer perspective because not all things are equal. And it's really important as you go to market to be thinking about things from a market perspective because of that world map slide I showed you. Every category is massively, massively crowded. A lot of people talking about a lot of things. So for every effort that you make on the product side, you want to make sure you can get maximum market impact. So make sure those conversations are happening and that you're soliciting information from the rest of the go-to-market engine. Fundamental number two, strategist, directing a product's go-to-market. This is distinct than directing all of the marketing. It's really making sure, are we doing the right things to make sure our market will be seen and adopted in the product? I'll tell you the story of, changed her name, real person. We'll call her Lori. She was a really talented demand generation marketer. Because she was doing such great work, they said, you know what? We really want you to grow and grow your skill set. So we're going to promote you up into product marketing. And she was super excited. So she showed up to her first product, uh, product team scrum and immediately started suggesting new feature ideas. Hey, guys, it'd be really great if we did this. And the product team was going like, whoa, where, where are these ideas coming from? And what are they in support of? And what are they helping someone get a particular job done? And she believed that she was adding value by giving suggestions and, and adding new feature ideas and didn't quite understand how the team was working. 
Similarly, when new product collateral needed to be created and the website needed to be updated, she just shipped them templates saying, hey, product managers, can you guys fill this out with all the information? And they looked at that and said, well, like, is there a point of view? Uh, you, I, yes, I can give you all this information, but shouldn't I be augmenting where you think this needs to go and what it's in pursuit of? And what she didn't realize was her job was, again, not checking the boxes or just being present or just representing a market point of view. It was to bring a strategic vantage point to how a product is going to market. And an easy way of thinking about this is every product's go to market is a puzzle. It is not straightforward. It is not a straight line. And you want to make sure that all the pieces are in place so that you know as you're adding things or as you need to adapt, it still adds up to where you want things to land. And just like a puzzle, you actually need the edge pieces in first for the picture to become clear to others. And I'll give you a specific a tool for that. But fundamentally, a shift that's really, really important that distinguishes what I'd say is typical from more strategic is when you look at a lot of go-to-market teams and what they're going to do, they tell you what they're going to do, how they're going to do it, why they're going to do it, and the last part is when. A strategic vantage point of that is to start with when. When you do something determines whether or not there is market wind at your back or whether or not it's relevant to your customer. So when actually is the most important thing in grounding something and having market meaning. Then it's the why. Is this to help position us as the market leader? Is this to fill our pipeline? Is this to uh, enable evangelism or build out a community? That why is what shapes the what. Because if it's in support of, of engaging a community, it might be take a very different shape. It might be book giveaways, as opposed to if it was trying to create a pipeline, in which case it might be a quick little ebook that has teaser text that people then need to provide a name to get the rest of. So the why very much shapes the what, even if a lot of the qualitative content inside might be similar. And then last comes the how. And this is the number one thing that I see a lot of teams making a consistent mistake on is that they have inverted this. They haven't done this inversion where they think when, then why, then the what, then the how. And one way that you can help your teams to do this is to clarify the go-to-market puzzle picture. This is something that I introduce in the book. It's something I call a product go-to-market canvas. And it's really just creating that one sheet so you kind of get a sense of where everything is going and why. And I'll just walk you through the basics so you have a sense of how it all connects. But you see that very top line is time, very important. That number one top swim lane is what's happening in the customer's world and the outside environment. This is crucial to do first, and this is often the missing step because people start with, what are all the things I need to do? You need to start with, what is the mindset of the customer? What's happening in the market? Is Apple coming out with a new version of its OS that's going to uh, that's going to change how people are thinking about what they want in our product. Is our number one competitor going to be announcing something or do we think, or have they just announced something or do they have a conference that we, that our customers might be hearing information from? The example that I have here is for a productivity app. So the types of things that are happening in the outside world that might be relevant are things like um, CES in Las Vegas, the consumer electronics show, <clears throat> a lot of direct to consumer applications technology is talked about there. There are tons of new computer owners, new device owners. And so what do you do with that? Q2 similarly, June is known as the dad, main June, the dads and grads period. A lot of new devices are hitting up. And so what does that mean for productiv a productivity app where people might be downloading new things on their new devices? There might be a Gartner symposium, or you see, of course, Q4 end of year holiday season. These are the things that are immutable and beyond our control, but can be things that we should be taking advantage of. And the act of doing this first really grounds you in, what are the customers thinking? What are they feeling? What do we see in the market landscape that, that should orient how we think about what we do? That second swim lane is product milestones. And I know not everybody knows what's happening in the world of Agile, but generally there might be major themes or major initiatives. So some are captured here. There's some social features coming. There are features for a vertical that were prioritized for the third quarter. Whatever milestones you are aware of, go ahead and put them in there. 
you'll immediately find, I've seen this without fail every time I've seen a team go through this, that as you start putting in the product milestones and comparing it to the market, first of all, people notice, whoops, there's no correlation. <laughs> and immediately things start moving around. But then that becomes a really part, important part of the exercise. The first column in that bottom half where it says strategies, those are the marketing strategies. So in this case, reinventing productivity, why you need the cloud for apps or teaching them to become engaged power users or that last one, embrace and migrate competitive product users. And then, like I mentioned, you want the edge pieces to go in first, which is why we have time and, that, and what's the customer's world and the strategies, all those edge pieces go in first. And then we start filling in from the outside in. For example, the reason, the reason why you do that is in Q4, you'll notice that there are an analyst in that third, uh, first swim lane for strategies, analyst briefing prep, major analyst briefing. We want to make sure that we have everything that we need. The number one thing analysts care about are how are customers actually using your product? Don't give me any of the marketing fluff. Tell me what they're actually doing. So you see in Q3 preceding that, there are a lot of customer migration stories that are making, making sure that they have those so that they're armed with them and ready with them for the time that they're briefing analysts. So you want to make sure that the things that will be required to be successful in out quarters are happening in the during, in the period in which of time in which it often takes to develop them. And just like product, a lot of things on the go to market side take time to develop. So that's why you want to have this this vantage point. This clarifies the picture for everyone. And especially for people that don't have go to market or marketing in their title or in their background, just showing the relationships and that all the stuff is being thought through really gives people a sense of, of ah, okay, I understand. Now I know how this is all connected. And this is not everything. You will have separate marketing plans for each marketing specialist. Here's our SEO plan. Here's our digital advertising plan. But you at least understand how some of the major pieces and parts all fit together. Fundamental three, storyteller shaping how the world thinks about your product. When I was a product manager for Word, we would go to usability tests. We didn't have all these great things like uh, Pendo or user survey. Was it, what was that your sponsor, Dan? User survey? User voice. User voice, yeah. thank you, user voice. I was like, oh my God, this stuff would have been so amazing. <laughs> we had to do it the old fashioned way, which was literally sitting behind one way glass watching people. And the very first time I went to a usability study, we had a document that we showed the user who self-identified, he was a middle-aged man, and he self-identified as an advanced word processing user. And so we usually gave people an hour, but we thought, oh, he's an advanced user. This this will take him 20 minutes. Any of us could have done this document in 10 to 15 minutes. Had some basic formatting like bullets and, and coloring text. So we had him start on this document and he sees bullets. And even though the bullet button is right in front of him, he starts menu surfing, doesn't find it, and hits the hyphen button. Similarly, he gets to coloring text, and the button for change of the text color is right in front of him. And he goes to the menus, goes to formatting, goes to text, goes to it goes two or three submenus deep to actually do this action and actually didn't even do it the way it was in the document. But he's like, oh, that's close enough. And we're like, oh, my God, this guy's advanced. What? And this was the beginning of us understanding that in that era, people were still using the word processor fundamentally like a typewriter. So instead of us trying to add features, we needed to do a better job of trying to use features on their behalf because they just weren't going to change what they were going to do. Because here was this advanced user thinking he already knew everything there was to know with buttons right in front of him that he wasn't using. Now, this is a very complex, this, you guys all are in product in some way. So you understand everything that I'm saying. We can't go out to the world. We couldn't go out to the world and tell that story that way. And so what you see on the right is how we actually crafted the story that positioned what we were doing and why. And we would draw this graph on a whiteboard or on a piece of paper, whatever was available. We ditched PowerPoint, which was this really big deal at Microsoft at the time, because of course, PowerPoint was a Microsoft product and we wanted everyone to see a PowerPoint. We're like, no, ditch it. So it sounds like it's a conversation. And we drew this graph and showed 75% of all the actions are super basic. 
And what you see on the horizontal axis is it's the utilization of the feature and the vertical axis is the frequency of that action. And so you're seeing those little bumps where for those who did discover the spell check, they used it a lot. For those that did discover bullets, they used it a lot, similar with symbols. And we looked at that and said, instead of us just having people not use these features or only have it be valuable for those that discovered them, we took each one of those little peaks and we pushed it into that 75%. And that's how we had the conversation and told the story that framed that what we were doing truly had value for how users actually were using the product. And because it was based on data, because we educated and showed them, they all had their own points of view of what they thought was important. We showed them the data of like, this is what people are actually doing. And it shifted people's mindset about how they would evaluate whether or not a word processor was good. This is an example of crafting a story which embeds a product's position. And telling a story is not just about storytelling, it's about ultimately creating positioning through messaging and everything else that you do that helps people understand why what you're doing has value, why they should lean in, pay attention, and what makes it fundamentally different. And I mentioned messaging being a huge part of that. And the very best messaging also positions. So I'm gonna pick on someone and be like, Troy, since I can see you, I'm gonna pick on you. These are two companies that were doing something in the analytics space, very, very similar. Can you read for us company A's messaging? Company A is the best tool for running a data-driven online business. Data-driven decisions lead to better results. All right, so I would tell you that one of these companies had a mediocre outcome and the other was sold for billions. And let me see, Nate, since I'm seeing you, can you read us company B? Company B. <laughs> reinvests business intelligence. Our modern data discovery platform takes a markedly different approach to analytics because it operates in a database. All your data is inherently drillable and explorable. So a lot of people think of messaging and marketing as, oh, it needs to be short, it needs to be spiffy, it needs to talk about business value, which that top statement does but it also tells us absolutely nothing. That could be about Microsoft Excel. There are probably 5,000 products that could say that. You know, it's a tool for running a data-driven online business. Okay, what isn't for you know, anything that's connected to the data chain? Data-driven decisions lead to better results. Yeah, we know that. So that's, it's short, but it actually has no value in helping us understand, well, why should we lean in and pay attention? And that's a dramatic contrast to what company B said, which was hyper-specific. We're trying to reinvent this. It's modern. It's a markedly different approach, but they don't just stay, make a claim. They say how they do it. It, is, it operates in database. It automatically gives you an impression. All your data is inherently drillable and explorable. This was not messaged for a CEO. This was messaged for someone who was actually kicking the tires on and assessing the product. So they knew who their audience was, and they wanted to serve up exactly what they needed to know so that they would lean in and want to learn more. And what surprised you that hopefully company B was the one that had the multi-billion dollar outcome. It was Looker. And the first one was RJ Metrics. And the CEO of RJ Metrics very famously said, he's like, yeah, we were trying to, do to create a better horse drawn carriage while Looker was basically building the Model A Ford. So storytelling, positioning, messaging, all of this is around crafting messaging that actually starts to position you so people understand this really is different, that it's not just marketing claims. This is really hard work and doing this well is way harder than it looks, but I just want to encourage you to, to think through who is this for and what's actually meaningful for them when it comes to developing messaging that helps also position you. How do you do this? Well, you collaborate and you iterate. Too often people in marketing go off in a room and say like, oh, we're creating this magical, wonderful messaging. And that's not how great messaging happens. It is a complete and total team effort in this era. 
And th this is one of my favorite teams. You got Han Solo, he's the sales maverick. You got Obi-Wan, who's the Sage engineering product team. You've got Chewie, who's operations customer success. And you've got Luke, who is the marketer, young, eager, trying to bring all these things together. But incorporating it all to create some Jedi level shit that really works on others' behalf, not just working for marketing. And that's the key in this collaboration and iteration. It needs to work for everyone's purposes. The sales teams need to feel like they can be more successful with how things are messaged and the product's position. And the customer success team needs to feel like a product's positioning, which is a collection ultimately of all the activities that happen, helps them be successful in retaining customers. And of course, the product and the go-to-market side that they need to be constantly collaborating in and and exchanging skills, as well as representing their points of view to make both sides successful. So collaborate and iterate. If you are not part of a messaging process and you're on the product side, you should be and vice versa. So just make sure that that happens and that you iterate based on what you're learning. So as things never develop it in a room, this actually just happened to me today. I was meeting, it was a marketing scrum, head of marketing, brand new product marketer and the CEO. And they're like, hey, we want your feedback on our messaging framework. And they were showing it to me. I'm like, I have no idea if any of this is any good. Here's my reaction. But you guys need to test the heck out of this. And then let's come back in two weeks and then I can actually have an informed point of view. And that's what should be happening in the modern era is collaborate, have some ideas, don't even try to get it perfect and just test it. Fundamental four is to be an evangelist. And by evangelist, I mean enabling others to tell your story. When I was at Word, one of the first, uh, one of the products that I worked on was Word for Mac. And we delivered a version that had abysmal performance and we were just scared about that. And so we had to do an update immediately to try and fix some of the biggest issues. And of course there was only so much we could do around performance, but at the time, the biggest influencers in creating a product success were press and analysts. And I can't see everybody, but I wonder, just pause, how many of you use word count on a daily basis? I suspect very few of you. I certainly didn't until I was writing a book and then I had to pay a lot of attention to the number of words. Now, if you are in the press, you are using it multiple times every single day. It is to you the bellwether of a product's performance because it's a big key feature for you to get your job done. And it was at the time, the number one way in which they were measuring Word's performance. So we couldn't fix everything about Word, but we certainly could address the word count performance. And so we focused on that because we knew it would have disproportionate impact on how much influencers would perceive our performance. We made it the fastest version of word count ever on any platform. We tested it like on everything and it was bomber. And of course, so when we put this release out there, the press totally noticed it and they said, wow, word counts lightning fast. I guess they've addressed some of their performance issues. So we focused on what was going to enable our most important evangelists and influencers at that time to be able to tell the story we wanted them to tell, which is they addressed performance. So when we talk about enabling evangelism, it takes many forms. Keep in mind that in the modern customer journey era, people try to do things on their own. They wanna get information, not from the official sources, but from real people and real sources that they trust. This means comparison sites. This means customer reviews. This might mean social media where they can get repeal. This just means scanning what everybody's written in, in an app's description or in those star reviews. Okay, what's the real deal? And I want to see both sides. I don't want to just read the five stars. I also want to see for those who are critical, why they're critical. And people are doing their own analysis. So if something is really important for your product to stand out, you want to make sure that the atomic particles of what people can talk about can appear in these versions of how others are talking about your product. They will not have your perfect messaging. They will not say it exactly the way you are saying it. So what do you want to have stand out so that when others are talking about you, you are excited about the position your product's going to hold. 
And again, keep in mind, by the time they raise their hand, this is a B2B example, but by the time they're raising their hand, 75% of their process is done. They've already tried to look for a lot of information to self-serve. And similarly, many people, if at all possible, try to avoid a sales path of any kind. They'd much rather do it themselves. So you want to make sure that you're enabling the evangelism for all the places that are creating influence. Part of how you do that is making sure that you've done the customer journey and persona work. And I actually just got this example. I found it one day randomly on the interweb, and I just thought it was outstanding for a bunch of reasons. But the biggest one was that it really examines how someone is thinking, what they're thinking and feeling as they're going through an evaluation process and then actually trying to get the product installed in their home. And I know this is itty bitty, you guys will get the slides, but there's this moment in here where she says like, oh my God, I can't believe this is so complicated. Why do they want all this personal information from me? I'm so frustrated. I think I might actually even use another vendor. And she's having these emotional highs and lows as she's going through the process. All of that is what you want to be paying attention to, because that is how someone is feeling in their experience with you as a company. And all of this creates position. All, all of this is part of the perception of a company and a product is all of the stuff that's attached to how they get the product on board, not just how they're actually using it. So paying attention to all of these things and making sure that the right organizations are involved in thinking this through are important. This includes sales. So enabling others to tell the story means enabling sales to tell their story. It might also mean making sure that the sales process is something that is paid special attention to. Company that I work with had a competitor that basically doubled the, the number of touches in their sales process and went, got their win rate from 30% to almost 70%. Very counterintuitive. Everyone's like, oh, we want to simplify, simplify. But it turned out people actually really liked the high touch because it made them feel comfortable making a leap that maybe was a little bit scary to them. And they brought customer success into that process early. They did all these things to make customers feel held as they were going through this process. And that shaped very much the perception of the product by the time they actually got to a product experience. So these are when you think through evangelism and enabling others to tell a story, these are all the different aspects of it. This can include a community, this can include evangelists, influencers, whatever it is for your product. You want to be thinking through the ones that have the most important market impact. It goes without saying it's always going to be sales if you have, or one of them will always be sales if you have a direct sales force. But then how influential are analysts? How influential are press? How influ influential are social influencers or even our app store position or our app store ranking? Those are the things to pay attention to in this fourth fundamental. So recap for fundamentals. I really hope that if you take nothing else away from today, it's that product marketing as a discipline is fundamentally about these four things being an ambassador, so connecting those customer and market insights on both sides, product and go to market. Being that strategist, so really directing a product's go to market. So everyone feels like each thing we do has purpose and we understand that purpose and we are comfortable with what the go to market engine is doing. It makes sense to us. We have the picture of the puzzle. We understand. Fundamental three, storyteller. So shaping how the world thinks about your product. This is messaging, positioning, all of that work. Really hard, really important, and almost always quarterbacked by the product marketer. And then evangelism, mostly done by others, enabling others to tell your story. But I, um, by others, I mean others in the organization, in the, in the sales organization, in the marketing organization, but the product marketer needs to make sure that the right stuff is happening and being enabled in all those folks that are actually doing this legwork. Nobody can do product marketing well without it being this massive collaboration. And I hope you take away from this that really anyone can contribute to the great product marketing happening. And if you are on the product team, help raise your product marketer up and help give them all the information they need to get really good at their job. And if the inverse is true, you're in product marketing, make sure you work really closely with your product and go-to-market teams so that what you are producing is extremely useful for everyone and is moving the ball forward. Don't just 
get it done, but actually move the ball forward for the product's adoption and what the business needs. And with that, I'm going to borrow from an Irish saying, may the market rose rise to meet you and may the market winds be always at your back. That's it for my talk. Excellent. Cool. Well, thank you for a great talk.